Well, uh, as you know, we're going to uh, try to keep our time frames solid so that uh, we don't run over time. So we're going to uh, study for 40 or so minutes, and then we're going to pray for about 40 minutes. But let's go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, we've been studying the, uh, the Holy Spirit, His person and His work. And again, we've been trying to uh, look at uh, different aspects of Him that... Um, uh, different portions historically in the church uh, have missed or at least have gotten wrong so that uh, they actually put themselves outside the church. But we've seen so far that the Spirit of God is a person, that He is a divine person, and that He is a distinct person. By the way, it, it may seem rather academic that uh, we're studying these things, but uh, it's interesting that within our congregation, uh, two of our members have interacted with two individuals that believe otherwise uh, since we've begun the study and it's forced them back to this material that we've been looking at. So I think it is uh, useful for us to understand it and uh, to try to master it so that we can use it to help other people who may also be mistaken. I think one in particular, actually both I think, ran into people who are part of the uh, UPC church. They believe Jesus only. They don't believe the Spirit is a distinct person from the Father and the Son. Uh, but as we've seen, he is a person, he is a distinct person, he is certainly a divine person. Now we've also been looking at uh, Edward's peculiar view of um, why the Spirit is called the Spirit. And that is because he is the love of God breathed out, the love of the Father for the Son, the love of the Son for the Father. And this was Edward's uh, explanation of the eternal procession of the Holy Spirit. And then we began to look at how his work in our lives, his work in the plan of redemption as a whole, uh, reflects his particular personality, his particular characteristic, that thing which is outstanding about him, uh, which is love. It's through uh, basically his uniting himself to our souls that he produces love for the things of the Lord, which is really what causes a person to come to faith in Christ in the first place. We're born spiritually dead. We don't want anything to do with God. That's because we hate Him. We won't come to the light. And then by His Spirit, He gives us a love for the light so that when Christ is offered to us, we want Him. He makes us spiritually alive. Uh, we saw last week that the work doesn't stop there, but the Lord continues to work in our lives, molding us and shaping us into the image of Jesus Christ. One thing Edwards pointed out is, certainly is biblical, that uh, the Spirit of God is the one who conceives Christ in the womb of the Virgin. And the reason he did that was to make sure that none of the effects of the fall would affect him, that he would come into the world holy, without any taint of sin, with, uh, with no flesh as it were, but he would come in perfectly holy. Edwards writes this, Christ, although he was conceived in the womb of one of fallen mankind, yet he was conceived without sin because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, which is divine love and holiness itself. That which infinite holiness and love immediately forms, it is impossible that it should have any sin. The thing I like about Jonathan Edwards is he's always asking the question, why? Why is it this way? Why did he do this? You know, why did God do it this way and so forth? And the answers he comes up with are very, uh, very instructive. Now, he also points out that Jesus was anointed with the Spirit of God above measure. I think on Edwards' view, it, he probably sees that as having happened when he comes into the world and not something that happens at a particular point in his life to prepare him for ministry. Although we do believe that there was also that descent of the Holy Spirit of his baptism that actually did do this. But we read in John 3.34, Jesus says this, For he whom God has sent speaks the word of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Actually, I think it might have been John the Baptist who said that. But the point was that the reason why Jesus speaks the words of God was because he has the anointing of the Spirit above measure. Edwards believed that, that what the Spirit of God is telling us through this passage is basically that the Spirit of God is the one who brings about the union between the second person of the Godhead, the Son of God, the Logos, and the human nature of Christ. 
Does anybody remember what the, what the uh, words hypostatic union means? It's one of those fancy theological terms, but does anybody know what that's talking about? Hypostatic union. It's the idea that Christ has two natures and they are united together, but they're united in his person. In other words, the two natures don't become one nature. They're not welded together and united together so that you have a God-man in that sense. But Christ has two natures, and those two natures are basically united in the person who possesses both of them. In other words, the eternal Son of God, who is the person of the man Christ Jesus, who is also, of course, the eternal Son of God, is the one who has these two natures. But Edwards believed that it was the Spirit of God who actually created this union between those two natures. This is what, um, this is what he wrote. The creature is more or less holy according as it has more or less of the Holy Spirit dwelling in it. But Christ has so much of the Spirit and has it in so high and excellent a manner as to render him the same person with him whose Spirit it is, which is an interesting view. Basically, he's saying that it's the, the divine Logos, or the second person of the Godhead, is the one whose Spirit it is, and he gives this spirit in, in, in basically infinite measure, or, or I guess in such great measure, to the man Christ Jesus as to render the person in that human nature to be the same person as the divine Logos. Now, why was that important? Well, it's because when the Spirit of God, well, let's just put it this way, the Spirit of God dwelling in Jesus Christ made the man Christ Jesus to be who he was and who he is now. And that is the same person, again, as the, as the Son of God. But um, when he dwells in us, he produces basically the same kind of nature that uh, Jesus Christ himself possessed. Uh, he, we, he transforms us into the image of God. In other words, it's the Spirit's work, even as he dwelt in Christ and made Jesus to be who he was, to dwell in us and to make us like him. And we saw some of the ways in which the Bible bears that out. For instance, Jesus is the one who's called the temple of God. And perhaps it's because the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him in bodily form. Um, the Holy Spirit dwelt in him above measure. But now we, if we've trusted in Jesus Christ, have the Spirit of God dwelling in us. And we are called the temple of God. And as the temple of God, the Spirit of God is transforming us into that same likeness and image. The scripture says that Jesus shares the same nature as the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But then with the Spirit of God dwelling in us, Peter says that we are partakers of the divine nature, not that we're becoming little gods, but that we are becoming like Jesus morally, ethically. We begin to love the things that he loves. Jesus came into the world with the law of God written on his heart. Well, in the New Covenant, the Spirit of God writes that law upon our hearts, which means he gives us the power to live according to the law of God, even as Jesus lived according to that law, we do as well. And that we do it with pleasure. It's, it's, our, um, it's our pleasure to serve the Lord, even as it was Jesus' meat and drink to do the will of his Father. So the Spirit of God gives to us such grace that we don't consider obedience or you know, a submission to the law of God to be a burden, but rather a joy. It's a pleasure to serve the Lord. So in other words, the Spirit of God transforms our hearts and he gives us a love for the same things that Jesus loves and we begin doing then the things that Jesus did. So this is how the Spirit of God is transforming us into his image. Now the Lord is the Spirit, Paul says, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So basically the Spirit of the Lord sets us free from sin. He sets us at liberty. Not to be free from the commandments, which is what a number of people in the church believe, but rather to be free from sin so that we might submit to the commandments and obey God lovingly from the heart because that's what we want to do. Now, again, uh, we're, we're looking at the work of the Holy Spirit. We've already seen his person, and we're seeing how his person and his work basically correlate, and how, they, um, you know, how one basically flows out of the other. 
And there's all these things that the Spirit of God does, and we don't want to go into too much detail on that because this is kind of an overview. We really just wanted to see how the character of the Spirit of God, um, how, how it works out in his work and why it is he does what he does because of his particular character. I think that's very helpful for us to know, to know what the Spirit of God is doing in our hearts and what it is he wants to do, what we can expect him to do, and uh, how dangerous it is for us to grieve him and to uh, quench his work, to pour water on his work so that these things don't happen. Uh, I think you'll, you'll see as we keep going through this, I mean, he creates love. He creates love for holy things. He's transforming us into the image of Christ. Do you want that work to stop? Or do you want it to continue? Well, there's things we do that can either promote it or stop it. We just need to understand what he's doing. We need to understand what we do that's, that slows it down, even makes it come to a grinding halt. Now, one other thing I wanted to add along these lines is that um, having our hearts transformed by the Spirit of God, uh, having our sins removed, having our guilt removed, and having this same nature that Jesus has, being partakers of the divine nature. In other words, becoming like Jesus Christ, uh, the Father does something for us that uh, he doesn't do for all. And obviously that's uh, true of a number of things when it comes to Christians. And that is he adopts us into his family. Now he adopts us into his family not just because uh, our sins are forgiven. And not just because we stand perfect in Christ, but he also does this because um, we're becoming like Jesus. In other words, um, you know, we're, we're a part of a body of people that actually reflect God's character. Uh, we are called the children of God, not just because we are in fact or positionally children of God, you know, because we've been adopted legally, but because we actually are um, have, well, with this changed nature, we are becoming like him. <clears throat> Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But with the Spirit of God working in you, little by little, that same character of the Father is being worked in you, which means that you are literally becoming his children and not just positionally. And, of course, being adopted into the family of God because you are, as it were, well, Christians, which means like Jesus Christ, like little Christ. Uh, you also become the heirs of the kingdom of heaven. Now, in seminary, whenever we studied adoption, we always considered the fact, okay, we're positionally perfect in Christ. God adopts us into his family because, you know, we, we are in Christ, and he looks at us as his son. Again, that's all, it's all positional. That's all, you might say, um, reckoned. It's all accounted. It's all, the technical term is forensic. In other words, it's a, it's a legal declaration. And we talk about the blessings that become ours, all the rights and privileges of the sons of God. You know, we can pray now, we can call God our Father and so forth, and, and all those things are great. But sometimes we miss this other aspect of it, the reason why we are adopted into the family of God as well is because we are like him. You know, we, we share that same nature now. And that's because we are partakers of the Holy Spirit. Alrighty, and that, that just comes from the passage, Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Again, that doesn't just mean positionally. Uh, that means that you know, being conformed to the image of, of Jesus means that literally we are becoming like him. And one day, we actually will be like him. All the sin will be gone, and all that will be left is Christ's holy and perfect character so that we will think as he thinks, we will speak as he speaks, we will do what he would have us to do. Now, that's how we're growing now, but uh, one day we'll actually be perfect and we'll be just like him, so that's great. Now, what I'd like for us to uh, consider in the, um, well, I guess you'd say the third part, uh, again, some practical things about what the Spirit of God is doing in our lives, uh, as he did in the Lord Jesus' life. Now, he didn't have to, of course, um, 
quickened Jesus to life. That's something he had to do in us because we were spiritually dead, but he was never spiritually dead. He came into the world spiritually alive because the Spirit of God is the one who conceived him in the womb. Uh, the Spirit of God really didn't have to do anything to shape him into that particular character that he was, although as a man he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. But in his love for the Lord, that um, perhaps was something that was there, and I don't know whether that you could say that actually grew or not. Um, so anyway, there may not be too much of a one-to-one -one correlation between us and Christ in that regard, except that he is forming Jesus Christ in us. And, of course, that's a rather significant one. But also in the same way that the Spirit of God worked in Jesus' life, he also works in, in our life. Again, you know, the, there was correlations between his love for the law, our love for the law, his obedience, our obedience, the way he obeyed, the way we obey, and so forth. But there's also correlations between how the Spirit of God was working in his life and how he works in, in our life. Uh, Jesus is, of course, an example to us of how we are to live because he lived according to the law of God perfectly. He loved his Father and he loved his neighbor perfectly. But his life is also a paradigm or a model of, of the spirit of God's work in a human being. I mean, Jesus is a human being. And the way he worked in Jesus is also the way that he works in us, which is interesting. And again, if we understand it, it helps us then to know what the spirit of God is doing and to make sure that we don't quench his work. So we're going to look at maybe four of those things uh, this evening, and we'll, if we run out of time, we'll just simply stop and pick it up next week so we don't go over time. Okay, so the four things we're going to look at are calling, guidance, uh, equipping, and empowering. So let's begin with calling. And I suppose we might ask the question, was Jesus called to a particular work? Uh, by the Spirit of God, and I should really just say one thing at the, at the outset. Um, sometimes in Scripture, it's, it's difficult to know which person of the Godhead is, is actually doing what. I mean, who created the world? Well, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, all things came into being uh, through him, and without him, not one thing has come into being which has come into being. That's talking about the Word of God. And then God sends forth his spirit, and they are created. Okay, well, it seems like the Father is creating, the Son is creating, and the Spirit of God is creating. And it's true that any work that God does is done by all three persons of the Godhead, uh, except, of course, for those particular things that they may be doing in redemption, although there's a lot of overlap there, too. So when we're looking at, you know... Um, who it is that calls Jesus, who it is that empowers Jesus, who it is that guides Jesus, and so forth. Sometimes it may appear as though the Father is doing it. Sometimes it may appear as though the Spirit of God is doing it. But I do believe that the Spirit of God is, as it were, the, the power by which God accomplishes his work. So that when the Father creates, he does so through the Son, but through the instrumentation of the Holy Spirit. And that might help as we you know, look at, at these particular things with regard to the Spirit's work in Jesus' life. Now, was Jesus called to a particular work? Well, um, actually, maybe what I could do just to relieve uh, the stress on my voice is, is to assign some passages, and that way you can get involved too and maybe not uh, uh, get, get drowsy. So who would like to read Isaiah 42, verses 6 through 7? Okay, Denise, you can read that one. And then let's just look up one other one in advance here. Let's see. Um, Acts 13.2. Okay, Donna, you've got that one. All right, so Isaiah 42, verses 6 through 7. Right. Now, who do you think that Isaiah is uh, speaking of here, or 
who is the Lord speaking of here? Who is this one that is uh, being called? Right. In the Old Testament, there's a, a lot. I'm sorry. In the Old Testament, there's a great deal about Jesus that's wrapped up in these um, uh, prophecies. And he is the servant of the Lord. Sometimes Israel is called the servant of the Lord or the son of God. But Jesus is the true Israel. He is literally a man of God, which I think is what Israel means. But he says, I have called you in righteousness. I will hold you by the hand and watch over you, and I will appoint you as a covenant to the people to do these specific things, to be a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. So Jesus had a particular calling in life, and certainly the Lord laid that calling on his life. But what was the Lord's calling? I mean, all wrapped up into maybe one word. Okay, redemption. He's the Messiah, he's the Christ, he's the Savior, and so forth, which means, you know, the Lord has called him to be prophet, priest, and, and king, and all that goes into that. Now, the Spirit of God laid that upon his life and led him, of course, through all that. We're going to get to guidance in just a moment, but the question is, does the Spirit of God work like that in your life? Is there any indication in Scripture that he does? And, and uh, I think Isaiah, or excuse me, Acts 13, 2 is... One of those indications. And while they were giving him to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Okay, was there um, a sense in which the Spirit of God called uh, these individuals to work? Certainly. Now, I guess the question more generally is Does the Spirit of God work like this only in particular individuals? Or does he work like this in all of his children? I mean, who is it that, you know, directs us with regard to a particular calling? And by the way, what do we mean by calling? What, what's wrapped up in calling? Does anybody know what a calling is? Another word for it is vocation in the Latin, yes. Okay, and what's a vocation? It's about what the Lord wanted us to do. Right. Okay, so the work that the Lord would have us to do. And what work would that include? Is it just the work that we might do for the church? Uh, I mean, what do we think of when we think of work for the Lord? What, what is that? You know, what kinds of things would that be? Okay, so if you're a mother, it's raising godly children, certainly. If, it, if you're a man, and uh, what, what would, that would also include, of course, um, if you're a father, raising godly children. But you know, what other types of things are, they, are there that we do for the Lord? That go up and... Uh, Besides, we do to earn a living and support us. Right. And, and the reason why it's important to see that is that um, work for the Lord is not just something we might do for the church, something we might do for one another as Christians, something we might do for unbelievers as far as witnessing to them. Uh, a vocation is what the Lord has placed upon your life as to how you will serve him throughout you know, your existence. Now, is that always going to be the same? No. Oh, it can change, right? Uh, the particular things he might have you do change. The general things that he has you do might change. But um, it's the Spirit of God who's basically directing all of these things. And, of course, as life goes on, those things might change. Uh, I suppose um, it, it used to, uh, it was sort of a, a uh, this is just one example, by the way. And it's, not, it's not the only example. But in, in seminary, uh, the people who went to seminary didn't often... They weren't often the youngest of, of uh, individuals, but had already been following a particular job or vocation for part of their lives, and then believed the Lord was calling them to do something different, and so they came to seminary. So it was um, a common question that was asked, uh, what were you in your former life? <laughs> you know, but, but both of those things were callings, you know, whether it's uh, to, to work in a particular vocation out in the workforce or whether it's to work in the church or whatever, all these things are really meant to be done for the glory of God. 
and whatever it is, we, we ought to be doing it for his glory. But it's the Spirit of God who actually leads us into that particular call, who gifts us, equips us, and uh, who shows us uh, what his will is. And, and that brings us to the second point, which is guidance. Okay, there's a call, but how do I know what my call is? How do I know what I'm supposed to use my life for? Well, you think the Spirit of God is going to call you to something and then not tell you what it is and make you guess your whole life? Well, first of all, did he guide Jesus Christ? Again, here's, here's another thing that we need to think about. Um, he placed his call upon Christ as the Messiah, but did he guide him? Let me, let me assign a couple more passages. Uh, Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 5. Jerry? Uh, John 15, 9. Uh, I'll take Rebecca. And then uh, Sarah, see, how about Psalm 143, 10? And then one more volunteer for Luke 4, verses 1 through 2. Okay, Dick? All righty. Isaiah 50, verses 4 and 5. Was that you, Jerry? Did you have that one? Okay, and translation, please. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, well, it's a little bit clearer in, in this particular one that I have. Let me just read it. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. So the idea that there is this guidance the Spirit of God is giving to him. Uh, this is speaking about Christ again in his you know, pre-incarnate terms. This is what he was going to do. This is what he's going to be. He was a disciple of the Lord, as it were. And the Lord God opened his ear and guided him. And, of course, he obeyed. He was an obedient son. But he does it by his Spirit. John 15, uh, 9 also talks about guidance by the Father. But I think, again, he does it by the Spirit. Who had John 15, 9? Rebecca? Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Hmm. That's John 15, 9? Maybe I have the wrong reference here. Oh, let's see. No, you got it right. I got the wrong reference. Let's see. Mm, maybe it was John 5, verse 9. Or verse, not verse 9. Maybe it's verse 9. <laughs> Boy. John 5, verse 19. Boy, that was way off. Okay, would you look that one up, please, Rebecca? John uh, 5, verse 19. It's an interesting statement where Jesus is basically saying that what he does is, is something he sees the Father doing. Do you think there's some kind of guidance here? I mean, he doesn't do anything unless he sees the Father doing it, and then when the Father does it, as it were, the Son does it in like manner. So again, I, I mentioned to you before that um, uh, this is basically a, a work of the Spirit of God guiding the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that's the way that the Lord actually guides us. Yes? So what does he mean when he says that, that the, the things that the Father does, the Son does it? So is he talking about the hand of providence there? Is he talking about human nature? Or is it well, I'm sure providence has something to do with it, but um, apparently the Father was giving to him guidance, and he relates it as something he sees the Father uh, doing. Uh, it almost sounds like he's mimicking 
the Father, but um, I, I'm not sure that the Father isn't doing these things through him, and the way that he's doing it is by the Holy Spirit. We'll have to maybe um, look more deeply into that, but that's about the best, I think, that uh, we can understand that right now. Uh, Psalm 143, verse 10. Okay, so David is praying that, the, that basically God would direct him, but he understands the way by which that's going to happen is the Spirit of God is going to give him uh, guidance. And then Luke 4, verses 1 through 2. Very good job of modernizing that for us. <laughs> but anyway, here's, here's an explicit text where it says the Spirit of God is guiding uh, Jesus Christ. I, I do believe that uh, Scripture indicates that the Spirit of God was guiding Jesus in everything that he did. Uh, there was this guidance of the Father, this leading of what Jesus should do in the world. And the Spirit of God, I believe, was, was helping him to do that. I, I think we could even surmise that um, even as the Spirit of God so filled Jesus Christ and uh, as Edwards put it, uh, made the person of, of Jesus Christ to be the same as the second person of the Godhead or the divine Logos, that what happens here is the Spirit of God is guiding Jesus or revealing to him the will of the Son of God to do his will. And, and again, it's whose will is it? Well, it's the Father's will, it's the Son's will, it's the will of the Spirit as well, but each has their particular role in redemption, so it may look like it falls out to a particular person in the Godhead, and yet all three of them are involved. Now, let's see, I don't think I assigned any passages beyond that, but the question we want to ask now is, does the Spirit of God guide you as he guided the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, John 16, 13. Let's see, somebody volunteer to read that? Donna? And then Acts 8, verses 39 through 40. Okay. Uh, Acts 8, verses 39 and 40. All right, uh, the John 16, 13 passage. So here's one kind of guidance. The Spirit of God will guide you into all the truth. And then the Acts 8, 39 through 40. So here's a specific example of um, guidance that uh, was, was literal guidance. I mean, the Spirit of God leads us into the truth. He guides us, but there is one particular instance where, um, and, and again, there's a question of exactly what he did to Philip. It says he snatched Philip away or something to that effect. The eunuch no longer saw him, and then he found himself at Azotus. Uh, the question is, you know, did the Spirit of God just pick him up off the ground and plant him over here, or exactly what happened? Did he compel him to go here? We don't know exactly, but we do know the Spirit of God was guiding him. There was an instance where uh, Paul, I uh, forget now which journey it was, probably the second journey, was trying to go into particular areas, and the Spirit of God wouldn't let him. And then he sees this vision of someone in Macedonia saying, come over and help. 
Uh, again, the Spirit of God giving guidance uh, to the church, uh, to the people of God. Now, the Spirit of God does call us. I think he made us for a specific purpose. And of course, part of our uh, struggle, part of our work is, is trying to figure out what, what exactly that is, uh, especially our youth uh, who are wondering, you know, what, what did the Lord make me for? What should I study when I go to college? Uh, or should I go to college? Uh, what does the Lord have for me? You know, it's, it's a big question. The question, though, is do you think the Spirit of God is going to provide guidance for you in that regard? Is, is it important that you know what you're supposed to do with your life? And is it important having gone into that particular um, avenue or that particular vocation to know what to do uh, in that call? Well, I do think the Spirit of God does guide us. We should probably ask this question, though, how does he do it? Uh, is he, does he speak to you directly? Uh, when you walk out the door and, and you're going straight and he wants you to turn right, so does he just make you, force you to turn right and force you to go this direction? Uh, does he pick you up off the, off the ground and stick you in other places? I mean, uh, there was one person who came here years ago to the church who thought that um, God's decree and his plan was such that he basically did what God uh, ordained him to do, and he really had no choice. It's actually a friend of Michael Owen's uh, uh, who said this, uh, that if, even if he went and made a beeline for some wicked place and engaged in wicked activities, that was God's will because he was there and doing it, which kind of exonerates you of all sin, doesn't it? Because God did it. I didn't do it. But how does the Spirit of God guide us? Terry? Well, okay. That's certainly one way gives us a desire for certain things. And uh, Kathy, you had raised a book up in the air and, and your intention was to say he guides us through books. No, he guides us through the, uh, <laughs> through the word of God. Okay, that, that's certainly the case. Uh, I remember one time uh, a pastor, it was actually an assistant pastor of a non-charismatic church. It was actually the, the church on the campus of the college that uh, we went to. And he said, I was walking down the street and I saw somebody across the street. I was about to get into my car and the Lord said to me, go and witness to that guy across the street. I thought that was quite interesting because um, basically non-charismatic churches don't believe that God actually communicates to you in that way. So what do you think he meant by that? Did he hear a voice in his head saying, go do this? Yeah. Or suddenly he has this strong desire yeah. to go talk to this person, and he can't shake it. He can't get away from it. Okay, uh, does the Lord guide in this way? Yeah. In my in my charismatic days, I experienced something like that, and and I was, you know, you you hear all of this about how the Lord speaks to you and so <laughs> forth, and I had something essentially like what this assistant pastor was saying. I was making a delivery, and there was this guy that looked kind of rough and burly and didn't look too friendly, although he may be on a you know, casual level and so forth. And for some reason, when I was leaving that day, I couldn't shake the impression that I needed to go and talk to him about the gospel. Now, the secretary inside the restaurant that I delivered was a Christian, and I had talked to her on and off as I would make deliveries. And so I went in and I asked her first, have you ever talked to this guy about Christ? Well, I have, and he hates Christ. He, he, he's really going to get upset if you talk to him. I said, well... Pray for me because I believe that's what I need to do. So I did, and he didn't get upset, but it in, in, you know, opened up a door to uh, communicate. But I had, again, this impression, this strong desire to go and, and talk to him. And uh, I think at the time that it was the work of the Spirit of God. I think he can give you a desire to do something. He can, I mean, have you ever, you know, had this overwhelming desire to go a particular direction and, and you, you go this direction? And it turns out that God does something in that direction. So we need to be careful, of course, of attributing that always to God or to his Holy Spirit, because sometimes it can be other things that are making us go that direction. So that's why we have to be able to sort all these things out and be very careful about um, anything that's entirely subjective. But I do believe God guides in that way. I do believe he guides us through the word of God. The spirit of God opens the Bible and helps us to apply it 
uh, the Spirit of God, um, uh, let's see, uh, Jerry, you had talked about desire, right? Okay. And then what about providence? No providence. We go this direction, the Lord shuts the door. We go this direction, he opens the door. He, he allows us to go through. Something takes place. Um, I mean, how does he open and close doors? How do you know what he wants you to do for a living, for instance? Well, let's say you go out looking for a job and you apply in a certain place and the, the people say no. <laughs> well, there's a closed door. Or another place, they say yes. Well, the Lord's opened that door for me, so I, I go through that door. And perhaps, you know, there's going to be several other kinds of changes. But God directs us, um, I would say, primarily through the word, certainly through providence, but also through uh, guidance. Uh, subjectively, just giving you the desire to do particular things. And again, you need to make sure those desires are godly desires. If they're not godly desires, it's not the Spirit of God that's giving you the, you know, the impression to go that way, but it's the, the flesh that's causing you to do that. Uh, so anyway, the idea is, though, the Lord placed a calling on Christ's life, and he made that plain by his Spirit. The Lord has a calling for your life. He'll make that plain also by his Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God will guide you. Now, do you suppose that his guidance will, will be um, greater or less? I mean, well, let, me just, let me ask you that question. Do you think it can be greater or less? Okay, and what makes the difference between it being greater or less? Would you suspect the guidance would be greater if you're filled with the Spirit versus when you're quenching the Holy Spirit? Now, does that give us one motivation to make sure that we don't quench and grieve the Spirit of God, right? The Spirit of God is, is doing things in our life. I mean, he, he creates this love for the Lord. He's transforming our lives into the image of Christ. He is placing the call on us and giving us direction as to what he wants us to do. All of those things are work that he does, and that work is, is contingent upon whether or not we're I mean, filled with the Spirit or we're quenched and grieving the Spirit, which uh, is, of course, a motivation, I hope, for us to want to walk in the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit, to use the means of grace to be filled with the Spirit, to be in the Word of God, so that the Spirit of God can guide us through the work. I mean, one of the ways that we're talking about that He guides us is being through the Word, but does that mean necessarily that, um, you know, I mean, is this how He guides me? I, I just go, Lord, show me your will. Oh, you know, you, you've heard the thing about Judas, you know, went out and hung himself and go and do thou likewise. Um, <laughs> You can't do it that way, but what you need to do is you need to understand what the Word of God says. You've got to read it, understand what it means. And then as you're praying and asking God for guidance, uh, oftentimes you'll find that a scripture comes into your mind that directly applies to that situation, and you have guidance. Or sometimes it, it may not necessarily be a, a verse, but perhaps a biblical principle. Or even just, just a word, you know, that the Lord just sort of shows you uh, what, what you need to do or the answer to that question. Uh, you know, it's, some people would say, well, you've, you've thought about the question. And even though you haven't been thinking about it, you know, for a while perhaps it's working subconsciously in your mind. And then certainly your mind does work that way. Certain things... Uh, are going on that you, you're not really conscious of, and then suddenly the answer appears to you. I, I think the Lord can, can do that too, but sometimes he perhaps just sort of superintends our thought process, and he brings to the surface that thing that we need to know at the particular time he wants us to know it. Now, I'm not saying that he gives to us, again, revelation. It's not something we should write down in the Word of God, but he guides our thought process. And often it's based in the Word. I mean, it's always based upon the principles of the Word. Uh, so th there's that kind of I idea, too. I, just the other day, I was just walking around as I was praying and just thinking about different things that, that uh, I was really seeking the Lord for particular answers for. And as I was praying, it just seemed as though the Lord was 
was bringing my thought processes to a particular place. I, I'd have to say that many times when I'm preparing sermons, he just brings ideas, things that I'm aware of, but he brings them, as it were, to the forefront. And it turns out this is a good illustration of this and that. So this isn't the same thing as, again, inspiration. It's not like the Lord is speaking directly to you. But I think we'd all admit that he does impress you with ideas that you've heard before, things you've seen before, things you've read before. He brings it to the forefront. And we do, again, need to be careful with that kind of thing. We need to make sure that that answer, that guidance is, is applied right and it's according to God's truth because there are other beings that can suggest ideas to your mind as well. Certainly your flesh can do that, and I believe demons can do that. Um, um, you know, sometimes you almost get the impression in the Reformed faith there's nothing supernatural going on around us anymore, that we just sort of dismiss that entirely. But, but there is a spiritual battle. There are spiritual beings that can you know, uh, also uh, give you certain desires and, and impressions and so forth. And we need to make sure that we avoid those. Um, our flesh can do the same thing. We just need to be careful that whatever we think may be God's direction, that that direction actually is uh, biblical. Well, I've talked myself into um, past 745, so I need to draw to a close. Let me ask if there's any questions at this point. Uh, next time we'll, we'll come back to this and we'll look at his equipping and we'll look at his empowering as well. But this uh, idea of calling and, and guidance, uh, I think we need to, um, as we're trying to discern what God's will is for our lives, we need to draw on every aspect of it and really seek the Lord and pray and let him lead us in his word through providence and to some degree through these desires that he puts in our hearts, although very guardedly and very carefully. Okay. Any questions, comments? I <laughs> what are we just talking about? <laughs> what was the study about? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, let's uh, let's close then with a word of prayer and let's try to gather as quickly as we can because we are going to end at eight thirty. Unless something, you know, happens unusually that uh, during our prayer time where it just seems like the Lord's not going to let us close at 8.30, but we really want to be careful to close at that time so it doesn't become a burden for everyone. But let's pray.